our process for moving forward with the shoreline management plan update was to update a 1994 document that was prepared by Baird, and that was called Consideration for the Shoreline Structures. That was started in, in May of 2017. Fiona was here and provided you with, or sorry, Ma March 2017. Fiona was here and provided you with a, uh, a presentation in May with preliminary findings and, and so forth. Um, and Fiona was subsequently uh, present at the open houses that we hosted as part of uh, the shoreline management plan process uh, in June, the two open houses that we had. Um, we now have received a formal uh, report from Fiona, which was circulated to you in your package. And Fiona's here, uh, and is gonna give you a presentation uh, on that uh, for you. And certainly answer any questions you may have as well as we go. So with that, I'll introduce Fiona. Thanks, Jeff. Okay, so I'm going to summarize the results of our study, which is an update to the report, as Jeff mentioned. So um, the presentation will go through first uh, a, a little bit of background on the study quickly, a uh, description of the shoreline. The, uh, briefly, I'll touch on the design conditions and what you, has, what you need to consider when you're doing shore protection design. Um, the shore protection that you have along your shoreline and what the shore protection options are. The issues with shore protection, some of the issues with shore protection, um, implementation, what goes into um, putting a project in place, and recommendations and next steps. So the background on the study, which I, I think everybody's aware of, in 1994 was the first shoreline management plan that ABCA did. And with that, there was a report written, Considerations for Shore Protection Structures, which was written by Baird, actually. And that's the report that we're updating, we've updated and that you have a copy of. Um, in 2000, the shoreline management plan <coughs> was updated to uh, reflect the new wording in the provincial policy statement on natural hazards. And then in 2016, you had the consultant's recommendation report on updating the shoreline management plan, which was a resolution was passed to stick with the 2000 shoreline management plan. Um, and in 2017, the public engagement process um, began in support of shoreline management planning. And this, so we had the meetings in the summer and then we were updating the uh, considerations for shore protection structures and also providing recommendations on permitting for shore protection structures. So this project had, had two main parts. One was updating the 1994 considerations for shore protection structures and the other was providing um, recommendations on permit applications and, and what should be included per on, in applications for shore protection so that they are consistent with um, the provincial policy and the technical guide. So here we are now at the end of the project here. Um, as I mentioned, we had a couple of meetings with staff um, and then we got going on, started on the report. We had two public meetings in June um, and then we finished off, worked on the report and finished it off, presented a draft and then a final report um, to Jeff and Alec. And then um, here we are today. So I'm just going to briefly describe the shoreline. I think everybody's fairly familiar with it. Um, so it's about 60 kilometers of shoreline um, stretching from south of Goddard, between Goddard and Bayfield down to um, near Ipperwash Beach. Um, and the north section of the shore, it, it contains really a, a few different segments, but there's eroding bluff in sections. <coughs> there are some sections that have uh, a, a sort of a narrower or, or, or sort of a, a moderate beach in front of the bluff like here as well. And then there's it, it, it's a beach section along, along the southern section of the shoreline. And the, the sediment that ends up down here is the sediment from the bluffs eroding up here. So briefly, just touching on the geology, generally there's, a, 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 there's bedrock covered with a, a Rannick till and then a St. Joseph till. The Rannick till is more resistant to erosion than the St. Joseph till. And so on sections of the shoreline where the, where the Rannick till is, is exposed, you'll, you'll have harder areas and where it's the St. Joseph till that's at the shoreline, that's where you'll have areas where, with higher erosion rates. And in terms of shoreline processes, which is the sediment transport, 
The whole of Oswald Bayfield shoreline is in a littoral cell that stretches from Goderich above your boundary down to Kettle Point. And within that littoral cell, sediment doesn't move into or out of it. So there's a barrier up here at Goderich and there's a barrier up here, down here at uh, Kettle Point. And, and the, the sediment within this stretch of shoreline doesn't move, move past or out of there and there's, there's, it doesn't come into here. There's no new sediment coming into, into here. Um, and then there are literal subcells. So these are the literal subcells here and they have a partial barrier to, to sediment. So for example, at Bay, this one's at St. Christopher's Beach, which is outside your area and then at Bayfield and then at Grand Bend. So these provide sort of partial barriers, but there is bypassing of the sediment into the next cell. Shoreline development, there are 60 plus residential subdivisions and the villages of Bayfield, Grand Bend and Port Frank. Most of the development is along the top of the bluff, but there are some interesting sections which is, is fairly unusual where you have uh, development along the bottom of the bluff. And in those areas you have some difficulties in, in protecting it because it is fairly low lying and exposed. So design conditions, the things that need to be considered when you're doing shore protection design, I'm, I'm just going to touch on this briefly. Uh, water levels, the water levels as, as everybody knows vary on the lake. Um, they vary seasonally with the highs in the summer and the lows in the winter. They vary in response to storm events, so you get storm surge when the, when the water is all pushed up against your shoreline. And they vary in the long term based on uh, rainfall and snow melt patterns. So we had a period, a sort of sustained period of, of lower water levels here and now, now the water levels have gone up again, but they do, they do you know, constantly go up and down. So we have to design for the higher water levels. And when you do have high water levels, the waves are bigger. So the waves along the shoreline are depth limited. And so when you have higher water levels, you have bigger waves that can get in and attack the shoreline. Um, the near shore lake bed is another thing to consider. So the erosion of the shoreline is actually controlled by the erosion of the near shore lake bed. So if you have a soft lake bed, then you're going to have higher erosion rates and the, the whole bluff and the near shore profile sort of marches back inshore. So <clears throat> when you're designing shore protection, you have to design it. For example, if you're designing a structure with a 50 year design life, then you have to consider 50 years of erosion of the near shore lake bed, which will make it deeper, which will allow bigger waves to get in. Um, ice, ice is always a consideration. Ice forces can be, can be very significant, I, but ice also can protect the shoreline during the winter storms um, from erosion. Geotechnical considerations, so when you're building a structure, you have to make sure that it's, it's founded on, on uh, solid, has a solid foundation, and it's not going to shift or move or, or be eroded away. And then climate change is a consideration now. So um, there, are, there are various different predictions on what's going to happen with the water levels, if they're going to remain fairly constant, or if they might go down, if there's more evaporation. Um, what, what we're assuming right now is that they're not going to change in a huge amount right now, but one of the big changes is that um, there is less ice on the shoreline, and so as I mentioned, the ice does protect the shoreline during the, the winter storms. So shore protection is something that provides a last line of defense for properties that are located in the natural hazard zone and are, are, are exposed to erosion. Um, obviously, the, the preferred approach is, is to set back um, and to lo locate uh, buildings outside of the hazard zone so then you don't have to spend a lot of money trying to protect them. And the provincial policy allows for development and site alteration on the, in those portions of the hazardous lands where the effects and risk to public safety are minor, could be mitigated in accordance with the provincial standards, and where all of the following are demonstrated. So um, development has to be carried out, protection works have to be uh, consistent with the protection work standard. That means that protection works have to be properly designed, designed by an engineer, really, um, and access has to be maintained. Um, there have to be no safety issues with in, in, egress and, and getting out if there is an emergency or an erosion hazard. New hazards are not created and existing hazards are not aggravated. So that relates to um, adjacent shorelines. You can't be creating new hazards when you protect your property. And that there are no adverse environmental impacts that will result. So um, this has to do with uh, one of the things to consider with environmental impacts would be um, protecting shorelines and the impacts that it has on downdrift shorelines. So that, that goes back to the sediment budget. 
Um, and, and when you do protect the shoreline, then you, you do remove some sediment for the budget. So these are all things that need to be considered. So we've classified the shoreline conditions along the eroding bluffs into, into three different shoreline types. Um, this top one is an area where you have high erosion and what you have is the St. Joseph Till is, is exposed here. And so what happens is there's down cutting of the near shore lake bed and you'll have higher erosion rates. So these dotted lines are sort of demonstrating the shoreline moving back. And, 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 and it, it, dem it also shows what I was referring to earlier that it's erosion of the near shore lake bed that controls the rate at which the uh, shoreline moves back. And in the second condition, these would be sort of more, more um, lower erosion rates. And you can see we're showing that the, the slope is, a, is somewhat stabilized. You get some vegetation on the slope. You have a, a limited beach um, at the toe of the bluff. And this is because the, the Rannoch Till is closer to the surface. So whereas the St. Joseph Till is exposed here, in the, deeper, in the deeper water, just in the near shore region though, the Rannoch Till is exposed. And what you'll get is sort of um, lag deposits, so sort of stronger material that doesn't erode as quickly and, and maintains the shallower depth. So it, it protects the shoreline as well. And then in the third example where you have low erosion rates, you'll have a, a moderate beach at the, at the toe of the bluff, but it's the, it's the Rannoch Till, which is the stronger till, which is controlling the erosion. So you'll have a much lower erosion rate because the lake bed material is stronger. So those are things that we need to consider when we're looking at the shore protection and to understand. So I'm, I'm just going to talk here about a little bit about the different types of shore protection that you have along your shoreline or that, or that could be used along the shoreline. So groins are, are shore perpendicular structures and they're designed to trap, you, there are quite a lot of groins along your shoreline, they're designed to trap the sediment that's, that's moving along the shoreline. So in this case, the, sh the sediment's moving this way. The groins trap the sediment. They have to be um, designed to be the right length and spacing. Um, these show some examples of groins on, on ABCA shoreline. So this is a steel sheet pile structure. And this is a, a gabion groin, which is, which is quite, quite short and, and doesn't do very much at all. You can see there's not much sediment there. Um, Groins are generally effective at, at sort of average or lower water levels, but when you get extremely high water levels, they don't, they don't protect the back shore area. So, you know, if you have a period of extended low water levels, you have a nice beach there and you'll, it'll be fairly protected. You won't get erosion on the shoreline, but when you need it the most, the, the groin may not be effective. Um, revetments, so revetments are generally constructed of armor stone. They could be constructed of other things, but what we generally find is armor stone. They do provide uh, fairly good pr uh, protection depending on the erosion rate. If you have a high erosion rate and the near shore bed is going down, there's, there's you know, definitely a defined life for them because as this gets eroded, eventually it will get undermined. But you need to design the revetment to account for that as much as possible. Um, with every shore protection type, there's pros and cons. So you can see here that here's a revetment and what it's doing is it occupies part of the beach. So you lose your beach depending on the beach width and it can end up being a barrier to access along the beach. Uh, sea walls, so there are a lot of sea walls they can, along ABCA shoreline. They can be constructed of armor stone, um, concrete, or this is an example of concrete schematic or steel sheet pile. What happens with a, a, a seawall is you get reflection, the waves coming in hit the wall and you get reflection off the wall and then you get more scour at the toe of the structure. So it actually increases the erosion of the lake bed. Um, in this case, one of the things you can do to, to, to mitigate that to some extent is to put a scour apron down in front of the wall. Um, this is an example of a steel sheet pile wall that has been flanked. So this section of shoreline has fairly high erosion rate. And, and as I explained, the, um, the near shore lake bed continues to erode. This structure is, is, is failing. And it's also being flanked at the ends because it's only protecting this piece of property and the adjacent property is not protected. Um, beach nourishment is something that can be considered. It, it's quite costly. It's generally used where you're protecting a larger stretch and of shoreline, there may be cooperation between property owners or a municipality may take on this type of shore protection. 
So you nourish the beach with sand. You have to find a sand source somewhere else that's a suitable sand size. Um, the sand size has to be generally as big or larger, most often larger than the, the native sand. Um, otherwise, it won't be stable. So in many cases, what we'll do is to add a structure to help to retain the beach. This is one in Toronto that we designed. Um, and, and it has been very successful. They've, they've never had to nourish this beach, and it's protecting all of these properties behind it. And, and oh, sorry, one other uh, positive thing about this type of protection is that, particularly if you just do beach nourishment, there, are, there aren't really any downdrift impacts, <coughs> any negative downdrift impacts. When you put in structures, you have to be careful that there's not erosion downdrift of the structure. Um, offshore breakwaters are another way that's similar to, to um, headlands and, and beaches. So you would nourish the, the, the beach in behind. These, are, are, um, these, these require a lot of uh, expertise to design them properly. They have to be, well, as with most shore protection, but these, the spacing of the length of the breakwater, the distance offshore, and the spacing, the size of the gaps, controls whether you're going to, whether it's going to be successful or not, and also whether you're going to have, um, these are salience forming, so the, the beach ends up coming out behind the breakwater, but it doesn't touch the breakwater, and if, if the breakwaters are longer and the gaps are smaller, you'll actually get tombolos forming, and the beach will come right out to the breakwater. So this is an example, and these structures can be surface piercing, or su this is a submerged one, this is one that's a low crest one. These ones are low crest, so they're, they're, uh, they're exposed above the water level sometimes, and sometimes they're below the water level. And again, this would require, it, it's usually used on a fairly long stretch of shoreline, and it requires cooperation between property owners, or, or it may be taken on by a municipality. This is ad hoc, what we call ad hoc shore protection. Uh, it's not designed. So um, here's some box cars that have been used, um, some concrete pipes, there's some, a, a timber wall, gabions. This gabion has failed. Gabion's not usually recommended on, uh, uh, along this sort of exposed shoreline on the Great Lakes. They have a, a, a fairly short life. Um, and, they, and they here you can see these people have tried various different means. You can see different levels of protection that have been added over the years. So they've got their gabion baskets. There's a wall here, then another wall is added here. Um, so it's different types of shore protection that you see. Issues with shore protection. Uh, there, there are, with groins, one of the big issues is downdrift erosion. Uh, when when you get a storm event, when you get high water levels, what happens is this, the sand will gen generally empty out of the groins, and then it will have to fill up again. So you can pre-fill groins, but um, when you have a storm and high water levels, they're going to empty, and then they would have to be filled again, and you do end up with an area of downdrift erosion. So um, there, are some, there are some challenges with permitting, too, from different agencies because they have concerns about this downdrift erosion, depending on the location of them. You know, they, they can be effective. For example, if there's a, an area downdrift that has a, a different type of shore treatment, they might work. Um, revetments, again, I had mentioned about the revetments, uh, how they, they can occupy the beach depending on where they're located and prevent access along the beach. This is another example along ABCA shoreline where there's a house that's been built really on the beach and then and then, it, and then the beach adjacent to it has eroded, and now there isn't very, there's no access along the beach. And then the cumulative impacts is, is, another, is, is something else to consider. So it is the erosion of these shorelines that provides the sand for the beaches down on the southern stretches. And as more and more of the shoreline is protected, there's, there's less sand for these beaches down here. These are just some examples of failures of shore protection. So this is a, a seawall that didn't, is not, um, doesn't have a high enough crest elevation, so it was overtopped, and you have erosion behind. This is another seawall that um, it's actually losing sediment underneath the toe of the wall because it's been scoured at the toe. And so all, you, we, you have all these sort of uh, depressions where material has actually moved out underneath the wall. Here's an example of a structure that's been built on the, on the sand dune, 
and, and the same thing again. So when you get high water levels and you get the natural, because a beach is dynamic and it needs to be able to erode and accrete, and when you have uh, structures built on the beach, then uh, you end up with, er and you have a high water level in a storm event, you have erosion and then those structures are exposed. Um, these are examples we, we looked at actually. So this is the Gabion wall that's failed, steel sheet pile that's been flanked and, and is being undermined. More sort of ad hoc protection failing. Here's an here's a armor stone wall. One of the issues with um, sea walls is that they fail catastrophically. So whereas a, a revetment is a slope structure and it, it can kind of adjust to some extent to the, to if, it, if the stones shift, it, it's not going to fail catastrophically, a seawall does fail like catastrophically. So this seawall was losing material from underneath the wall and, and, and the whole thing just failed. So the recommendation that we have is that the shore protection should be designed by a, an engineer with experience in coastal engineering. And these are some examples of, of shore protection that's been designed by by an engineer, so this is uh, this has got a, a backshore protection and then a cobble beach. This is a revetment. Different examples of revetments. Uh, implementation. So what's required when you're going to put shore protection in place? Um, it has to be consistent with the shoreline management plan and the considerations for shore protection that we were just updated. Um, permits and approvals are required. Uh, then you go ahead with the preparation of the final design. Ownership is something that needs to be considered, so ownership of the lake bed. Um, a community approach is recommended. Um, there are some things to consider during construction, which I'll go through, and then um, permits can require monitoring and maintenance, which is something that should be done in any case. So with respect to the shoreline management plan and considerations from shore protect, for shore protection structures, um, the SMP 2000 provides direction regarding um, shoreline management planning. So it says that where erosion is an issue, non-structural approaches are preferred, so that would be setbacks. Um, non-structural approaches, uh, you know, include uh, observing the setbacks, relocating away from the bluff, and considering the use of um, consolidating lots. Just looking at approaches to, to move away from the hazard rather than putting protection in. Um, shoreline management in Ontario and globally is, is evolving, so Things that were done in the 90s are, are different from approaches that are generally used today and many of the conservation authorities have updated their shoreline management plans um, the, and that the shoreline management plans are to be consistent with the provincial policy statement which says that no new hazards are to be created, existing hazards not aggravated and adverse environmental impacts don't result from the shore protection. So here are just some examples, not a comprehensive review but we, we looked at some of the different conservation authorities and what they have with respect to um, permitting for their for shore protection work. So Conservation Halton uh, requires that shore, shoreline works can only be constructed where the shore protection works are designed and in installation is supervised by a professional engineer with experience and qualifications in coastal engineering. That, that's their requirement. Um, Sogging Valley shore protection structures must be designed by a professional engineer with experience and qualifications in coastal engineering. LTVCA shoreline protection shall be designed by a qualified engineer. CVCA requires coastal engineering report and a letter of opinion. So all these are to address, um, to make sure that the work is going to be uh, consistent with the protection work standard and, and that it's going to be consistent with the provincial policy and their shoreline management plan. Um, and then there are some of them that, that you know, say that uh, a coastal report may be required at their discretion. And there are, I would, I don't, I didn't, we didn't go through all of them, but these are the ones that are sort of, some of them that are sort of nearer by to you. And, and these changes have been made, you know, over time. Most of them maybe didn't require coastal report, didn't require sealed drawings you know, years and years ago, but they, they, all, they, are, they are all in the, progress, in the process of updating over time. So um, in terms of permit applications, um, permit applications should be required for all shore protection works. And these are some of the things that we would recommend that the protection, that the application should include information on site location, site description, environmental features, 
um, details of the proposed works. There should be sealed drawings provided for the proposed works. Um, specifications on the materials to be used. Some conservation authorities actually won't allow you to use, for example, steel sheet piling um, or concrete even. So, and it varies with the conservation authority, but there should be information on the materials, um, the coastal conditions and the design parameters, um, understanding of the sediment transport, a description of the sediment transport, uh, construction schedule, access and maintenance requirements, so ensuring that there is is enough access for maintenance in the long term if you have to get a backhoe through again uh, um, and a monitoring program. Also it needs to demonstrate that no new hazards are created and existing hazards are not aggravated. Demonstrate that de the development is carried out in consistently with the protection work standard and the access standard so the protection works are, are designed. Um, for the conditions that you have that we went through, like the water levels, waves, ice, geotechnical, um, climate change. Demonstrate that the proposed works will not adversely affect sediments transport and no adverse impacts on adjacent properties. And really this is also for your protection because, you know, th these kind of things can have ended up in the past in litigation when a downdrift property is, is affected. And demonstrate that there are no adverse environmental impacts. Um, so, when you're preparing final engineering design, final designs for shore protection, uh, they should be pre prepared by a PNG with experience in coastal engineering. And the design typically, like typically when you're doing the design, what we'll do, an engineer would do is a site visit, um, come up with a concept design for the owner, and then agree on that concept, prepare the final designs and the tender documents, and then submit the permit applications, usually it's good to speak with the agencies for early on. Um, we would actually speak with the agencies at the concept design phase to make sure that uh, the agency doesn't have any issues with the, with the design that's being proposed before we go ahead to final design. Um, you can have an engineer assist with the tender, tendering process if you, if, you, if you wish, it can be helpful. Um, construction observation, so some of the CAs require that you have an engineer on site part-time, at least doing some site visits during construction to ensure that it's constructed uh, properly and then monitoring. And other things that to consider, is, as I mentioned, is ownership. So ownership of the lake bed, if you're, head, if you're out on the lake bed beyond the property line, then you would need to get a, a permit from MNR under the Public Lands Act. Um, the community approach, which was mentioned for a, a number of the options, it's, it's, it's often good when people can work together. Um, then you, you can try to deal with issues like flanking. You saw the steel sheet pile that was just sort of sitting there on its own. Um, construction, it's important to get a, a contractor that uh, has experience in shoreline works and monitoring maintenance to be carried on after. So our recommendations from the report. The report addresses structural protection intended to stabilize um, eroding shorelines. It doesn't deal with non-structural protection, so it doesn't go into setbacks and it doesn't go into drainage and slope vegetation, which are other approaches that can be used, particularly in areas where the slope can, uh, is not eroding too quickly. Um, prevention versus protection. So as I mentioned before, prevention is the preferred approach. It's better to do that than to have to spend the money and try to fight nature and, and put something in along the shoreline. It's better to work with nature and set back. Um, eliminating shore, uh, shore protection works. Um, so shore protection works, the bluff is naturally eroding and by eliminating the shore protection works, you're, you're, you're returning it to its natural state. I know, I know that maybe that's not, that, that's not gonna work in every case, but it's something to recognize that um, when, you, when you do put in protection, you are affecting other things around you. So you're affecting downdrift shorelines, et cetera. Uh, the province and the provincial policy 2014 states that no new hazards are to be created, no adverse environmental impacts. Um, and construction of protection works, as I, as I mentioned, has an impact on downdrift shorelines. So looking at the different shore protection options, um, regional beach nourishment we talked about, it's good in the sense that it doesn't negatively impact the coastal processes, but it is costly and it does require cooperation between uh, property owners. A rubble mound revetment is effective in areas with lower erosion rates. 
If it's a very high erosion rate, there's going to be a, a limited design life to any structure because, as I mentioned, the near shore lake bed is, 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 is being down cut. Um, and in those cases where there are very high erosion rates, it's going to be costly because you're going to have to keep replacing it and rebuilding it. Um, flanking can be an issue if adjacent properties are not also protected. And as, as we mentioned, it, it, does impact, it can impact access along the beach. Seawalls are generally not recommended. They increase, increase reflection, so a revetment is preferred to a, to a seawall um, in general. And they can fail catastrophically, uh, so that's another thing. And then you're left with sheet pile all, or whatever you've used all along the shoreline. Um, groins, they do enhance the beach. They don't provide protection generally at, at uh, high water levels. So what happens is during when you really need it most, uh, sand is emptied out and you get erosion of the shoreline during the high water levels. They do have downdrift impacts and there can be challenges with getting permits because of that. Offshore breakwaters and beach nourishment, they can be effective as well in the, in the right location. Again, they're fairly costly and um, like go groins, there can be downdrift impacts. So you have to look at, you're retaining the sand in that section of shoreline and you may be pushing the sediment transport further offshore and there, there's an area downdrift that is starved of sediment. So those are our recommendations with regard to, set, to uh, shore protection. Um, for implementation of any shore protection works, the shore protection needs to be consistent with the shoreline management plan. Um, land ownership needs to be established, so that includes the lake bed. Uh, design of structures below the 100-year flood level, so that, that's mostly shore protection works along Lake, on, lake Huron. Um, should be designed by an engineer with experience in coastal engineering. Um, the permits should require the information that we went through previously and be, be a complete submission. Um, a coordinated approach between property owners is advantageous. Um, quality control during construction is, is, is important and, and ongoing monitoring after, particularly when there's been high water levels. If you want to go out and look at your structures and make sure that there hasn't been any damage to it that you should repair right away before it gets worse. Um, so finally, some recommendations for additional studies. We're recommending that to update the policies and procedures for, procedures for shore protection to be consistent with the PPS and the technical guide. Um, update the Ossible Bay Field inventory of structures. That was last done in 1990, um, so it's quite out of date. And if, if, um, if that information was used when permits are submitted, then that could be kept up to date when, once, it's, once it's updated. It could continue to be updated with uh, any shoreline works that are constructed after. Um, it would be useful to update the sediment budget that was prepared in 1989. There are some questions that have been raised in recent shoreline management plans about bypassing at Goderich. Um, if, it, if, if the sediment is stopped at Goderich, what impact that's having on the downdrift beaches. And also to continue collecting the oblique air, air photos that have been collected by ABCA. Those are really useful. So that's it. <coughs> Sorry, I went a little bit long. Any questions? Or is there any questions? Hey, you, you would share the, how much would a coastal engineering cost for like a turn foot lot or something? For a 200 foot lot, well it, it actually doesn't vary too much between the size of the lots and it depends what you do, so it depends what's required. If you're starting from scratch, it could be, we just did one, like a typical price would be maybe 20,000. Um, and if there's construction supervision included, maybe it's 25,000, something in that sort of ballpark. But uh, you know it would vary from it would vary with the site. Oh, yeah, because conditions of the soil. And the soil. Yeah, yeah. Mike, I think part of the challenge that we've been faced with is that the, it's like a, an interpretation whether it's required or not here, and if we could have some sort of a standard, it's, it's kind of a um, between staff and the board. It's one seems to be kind of a judgment call. Yeah. Um, yeah, and it, it is 
you know, as I mentioned, it, it is changing. It has been evolving, and I think most of the CAs that we work with do require, you know, a coastal, they do require a coastal engineer to be involved. Um, some of them will just, as I, as you know, as was as shown on the slide, some of them will ask for it if they feel it's necessary after the permit has been submitted. They'll ask for a review. Um, I, but generally, I, I mean, I'm not trying to drum up business or anything. But <laughs> if we, if we design it, then it's going to last, right? Whereas if we don't, if if you don't have an engineer involved, it's like you, you're not going to go and put in a road without somebody designing it. It's it's just sort of you know, if you, if, you, if you have an engineer involved, then you know it's going to be designed properly and it's going to last. And also, you know, an engineer is able to look at those downdrift impacts, which is becoming, you know, it's, it's becoming more and more of a, something that needs to be looked at as directed by the province. Just one yes, question further to that. Did, did, we, did one of the proponents before Jeff not say that they couldn't find an engineer, or that the engineer wouldn't respond to them? We had asked for uh, as staff a, an assessment of the design. So we were trying to uh, address or deal with it as best we could. They weren't willing to do a full-blown design. So we asked for an assessment of the design that was advanced by the contractor. That's what they thought. And that's, they also had suggested they were having trouble contracting any coastal engineers. So we, have, we have quite a list of engineers, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. No further questions? Thank you. I, 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 I just had, okay. I'm uh, sure if you want to just make, I know we struggle here, so for the board, so you put up there the recommendation or preferred. Redundant and not necessarily the seawall, I guess, for the board and for us. How would you recommend if something, if, if it's not the preferred method, we can't tell necessarily people which type to put in, but if they come to us with a seawall that they want to do, how would you recommend that we handle that? So, if you can answer that, I don't know. Yeah, so I mean, it depends, like, all, as I mentioned, different conservation authorities handle that differently. So. I know, for example, at Halton, um, it's they have they have certain requirements. Like they won't let you put in sheet pile. They won't let you put in concrete. They are very strict. I think compared to some of the other conservation authorities. Um, so in most cases, in, you know, in many cases, another approach is you you can educate the public. So you can explain to them what the pros and cons of the different methods are, and then you know. Um, at least educate them so that decisions are are, are more likely to be. They, at least they understand the difference. Because I, I, I you know, I, I don't think many people do understand the differences and the pros and cons of them. It's fairly specialized area. Well, so. let me jump in. Um, I'm familiar with two or three examples of revetment in uh, the municipality of Blue Water. Mm -hmm. They're extremely problematic. Pedestrians on the beach, and in fact, yeah. the high water, the, these things go right to the water's edge. Yeah. So there's no way to get around them. Yeah. And children, especially, or seniors, and or um, they could break a leg in a heartbeat trying to clamber over these. Oh, uh, I agree so, with you. So, like, each case is different, right? Each case is different, and it also depends on how much space you've got there. How much, how much beach you've got, but I, I agree. Like I, you know, there were some examples there where um, you, you can't get past it, and it's it's really put a barrier across the beach, which is which is a big issue. I I would agree. So I, I mean I think there are there are situations where maybe that maybe a seawall would work. It's just in general, you're going to end up with increased reflection off of it, which is going to scour out the lake bed in front of it and then you end up losing the beach as well because it gets deeper there so and your display here i was reading in there also landowners look at the life cycle of some of these things too there's other ones in there only last 10 years 
the last 25, and it's 15 and 100 years. So it depends what you want to do with your property for the future. Right? You, know, you want to do the best to have it and be stewards of the, of the land, too. So. Brian. Uh, a question. Uh, I have a very limited experience with the shoreline protection. So the question is, when you have a uh, request come in with five neighbors agreeing that there's one that isn't involved, is there a, there doesn't seem to be, or, or is there a set policy on that? Because as you're showing here, the adverse effect mm -hmm. to that, to those shoreline. But when there's one neighbor, I guess I'm asking where, where we sit on that. Because obviously that's not recommended. You want everyone involved. Jeff, what do you, have you had that happen? Uh, certainly we've had that happen. Uh, I guess we look at each one on an individual basis. So the one uh, landowner that may not be willing to enter into it. Are they in the end? Are they in the middle? What have you? We're looking at what is the design um, of the structure. We're looking at how much it's currently eroding. Is this a high erosion area? Is it not? Um, all those things go into play when, when staff is considering it. Um, I can suggest that if, if someone is right in the middle um, and there's walls on either side, that's more likely to trigger staff asking for a coastal engineering assessment. And we've had some of those come here before you before. If they're on the ends and it's a low erosion area and they're tucking it close to the, the toll of the bank, and uh, you know, it, it, we, we perceive that as less of a risk, and typically that's something that staff will, will approve. If it's a high erosion area, and we've seen some of these, that's typically what we're seeing right now is the high erosion areas, that has the potential, I believe, to have a greater impact on abutting neighbors and neighbors further down drift. So again, that becomes something where we're going to likely trigger uh, a request for a coastal engineer. So unfortunately, there isn't a policy that says, under circumstances A, B, and C, you ask for this. It's all based on the, the proposal that's coming in, the site characteristics, the number of people, and, and so forth. So there isn't uh, that strict. Okay. So if, if I follow up on that, so we don't have the authority or the right to say if we feel that, or if staff feel that that last neighbor needs to be involved, there needs to be protection there to say you either have to get them or it doesn't happen. Nope. We don't have uh, the right to, to tell someone to do that. What your responsibility is, is to make sure that when you're improving something, it doesn't impact that neighbor. So that's your responsibility. We cannot force someone to do something they don't want to do. Okay. And Brian, briefly, I can give you an example in our subdivision, which is Lakewood Gardens South. There was an example like that. It was prior to us going there where there were six waterfront neighbors and they were going ahead with a shoreline protection and a neighbor somewhere in the middle uh, refused to contribute and they went ahead without that person but there, at the time there was some discussion about the group paying to put the protection in front of the person who wouldn't pay and they didn't and they regret it now because not only is the neighbors or that person's property completely wrong but it impacted the neighbor to the north and south. And now the money they spent is virtually worthless. It's tough. So, so they, uh, this is not coming under the planning board, so it can't be only me. Uh, so if something doesn't happen properly, what do you think it's going to be only me? So this is just basically the board here, and they're the ones that are responsible for uh, at least making sure that everything is done with what the regulations are talking to you. Dave, hey, uh, Jeff. Yeah, maybe I'll just clarify. It's a good question. Certainly under uh, the regulations, um, we have to be mindful of the legislation and our duties to make sure that, that everyone is protected, uh, that, that we're not causing or approving something that has a negative impact. If we do, then it's not the OMB, it's uh, liability. 
it's legal liability, which is which is a problem. Certainly, when one is uh, looking at an application under the Conservation Authorities Act, there is an appeal mechanism by the proponent to. Well, currently, it's the Mining and Lands Commission. Be the, I mean, it's the Environmental Land Tribunal as of April first. So they have a means by which they can appeal. So that's kind of our form of the OMB. But a budding neighbors that may be negatively impacted, their only recourse is to sue. And they will, you know, historically we've seen what happens. They'll sue everyone. Okay, so I, right now I think we should have a motion to accept this for information because we can't go further because some of our members aren't here who want to see this all before anyway. And so I think we should just take it for information purposes only and then maybe the staff will wrap it as a synopsis for the ones that aren't here and that's ourselves. And I'll take it that you made that motion. Yeah. Dave moves, uh, Mike seconds, all in favor, motion carried.